This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a video cast on cardiac subspecialty anesthesiology topics. It's part of our high yield keyword review here at the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology. As a reminder, these keywords are based upon published American Board of Anesthesia keywords over the last more than a decade. And in 2017, these were the key words Doppler ultrasonography principles, pacemakers, physics of ultrasound, things like perioperative MI risk factors and preoperative electrocardiogram, when to get one, some of the physiologic changes of aging and some congenital heart disease questions like Fontan single ventricle physiology, atrial natriuretic peptide and some factors that cause the release like distension of the right atrium, Bain bridge reflex as the right atrium distends the heart rate speeds up, bradycardia and heart transplant, you have a denervated heart after heart transplantation without a vagus or sympathetic innervation. The heart's slow. Beta agonists can work to speed it up. Cardiovascular effects of vasopressin, V1-mediated vasoconstriction. Carcinoid syndrome, cardiac lesions. Carcinoid and serotonin affect mainly the right-sided valves of the heart. Tricuspid stenosis can occur and tricuspid regurgitation. Pulmonary valvular problems also digoxin toxicity and balloon pumps like don't put them down when you have severe or moderate aortic insufficiency because they inflate during diastole and will increase more going backwards through that aortic valve and dilate the left ventricle. Cardiovascular effects of milrinone, inotropy, and vasodilation of the systemic vasculature so it's an inodilator. Oculocardiac reflex when you tug on the eyeball you can get a reflex that goes through the trigeminal nerve and then comes back to the vagus nerve slowing the heart rate. Pulmonary hypertension, some causes like bad COPD, uh, pulmonary emboli, how to calculate both systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance, and other keywords. Interestingly there were no keyword gaps in knowledge in Cardiac 2017. Those gaps in knowledge are questions where more than 50% of people taking the exam miss the topic. In 2016, just as a uh, review, there was more questions uh, about Doppler ultrasound principles, and you can see some of the keywords were repeated year to year, preoperative electrocardiogram indications and periop MI risk factors, what happens as you age to the cardiovascular system, again, the Fontan, congenital heart disease, uh, lesion, uh, and repair where, for patients with just a single ventricle. The fact that elderly patients' systemic vascular resistance actually goes up, amiodarone, and how it affects both the lung and the thyroid and also the eye. Beta-1 up uh, regulation of the receptors. How does that occur and why does that occur? Beta blockers actually cause them to upregulate. Things that cause it to downregulate are exogenously administered catecholamines, for example, or uh, a patient who is being administered intravenous epinephrine, norepinephrine, can make the uh, beta receptors on that patient's heart downregulate. Blood supply to the AV node, usually through the right coronary artery, but if it's a left dominant system, could be through the circumflex. Bradycardia and heart transplant, again, this is a denervated heart with no vagus or sympathetic innervation, and if it becomes bradycardic, it's not going to respond to atropine, and it will respond to exogenous and endogenous beta agonists because the beta receptors actually upregulate, another cause of upregulation of beta-1 receptors. Carcinoid syndrome, serotonin goes up, right-sided uh, valvular lesions like tricuspid regurgitation, cardiomyopathy, how do we diagnose it, cardiac tamponade, uh, what is our hemodynamic goals? One of them then being keep the patient's heart rate up. Another is keep their systemic vascular resistance up. So fast and full and hard. Some cardiopulmonary bypass issues uh, and the cardiovascular effects of vasopressin, V1 mediated vasoconstriction. Digoxin toxicity, if potassium's down at the same time that you have high levels of DIG, DIG toxicity because it affects the sodium potassium ATPase is increased. And gap in knowledge, two of them in 2016 related to cardiac keyword topics. One is that when your thyroid hormone goes up during hyperthyroidism, uh, 
you actually have an increase in beta-1 adenoreceptor density in the cardiac muscle. And another one that if you have gas coming into the oxygenator of a cardiopulmonary bypass machine and you occlude the outflow of that gas from the oxygenator and you keep pouring in gas but occlude the outflow, the gas can bubble in the oxygenator and can cause a gas embolism. But let's move on to our keyword topics, part one of three-part series. In part one, we will cover cardiac anatomy topics, cardiac physiology keywords, and some preoperative cardiac evaluation keywords. In part two and three, we will cover the other topics listed here. Car coronary anatomy, electrocardiogram, and TEE, the first keyword. The dominant coronary artery, by definition, is the coronary artery that gives off the posterior descending, which is usually the right coronary artery, but occasionally the posterior descending can be come off the left circumflex, and then it's called a left dominant system. The AV node is usually supplied by the right coronary artery in 90% of patients, but in a small number, about 10%, by the left circumflex. So you can see that if someone had a right coronary artery occlusion and the AV node didn't get good blood supply, how you could get AV block, especially with like an inferior MI. The correlation of the walls that are perfused by each of the coronaries are next. The LAD supplies the anterior wall, and the anterior electrocardiographic leads are where we look for EKG changes when there is uh, problems with the LAD, V1 through V6. In coronary bypass surgery, grafting is usually done from the left internal mammary artery to the LAD to supply better blood, su blood flow to it and the muscle that it supplies. And also, saphenous vein grafts are often put to the diagonals, and the diagonals are branches of the LAD, and occlusion of those will also cause problems in the distribution of the uh, anterior wall. Now, the circumflex coronary artery supplies, in general, the lateral wall, and the lateral electrocardiographic leads, 1, AVL, V5, and V6, are the ones we monitor. If we see ST segment elevation in V5 and V6, we think, hmm, that's the lateral wall, could be circumflex coronary artery, a problem. And if it was ST segment elevation, we may send them immediately off to the cath lab for some type of intervention like stenting. Grafting to the circumflex is usually done to its branches, and the branches of the circumflex are the marginals. The right coronary artery supplies the inferior wall of the heart, and when we think of the electrocardiographic leads that correlate, we think of the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF. Grafting of the right coronary artery is often a saphenous vein graft to the posterior descending artery. Again, the AV node supply is usually associated with the right coronary artery in a right dominant system. The pictures on the bottom, first of all, we'll start on the far left. You can see in green the distribution of the right coronary artery, the inferior wall mainly, and the red representing the circumflex coronary artery, the lateral wall, and the blue representing the distribution of perfusion of the left anterior descending coronary artery. In the middle, the classic transgastric mid-papillary short axis TE view is shown the right ventricle to the left and the left ventricle to the right with the papillary muscles extending into the uh, part in, inner part of the heart. And again, it would be the inferior wall, the lateral wall I'm pointing to now, and the anterior wall, the distribution of the right, the circumflex, and the LAD. Now when we go to the transesophageal echo mid-esophageal four-chamber view, where you see all four chambers, now the walls that you're seeing are actually the lateral wall and the septum of the left ventricle all the way from the base, mid, and apex of the heart. But you're not seeing the anterior and inferior wall because they're uh, out of the picture. Some select TE images and anatomy. Midesophageal four chamber view first up at the top left. The four chambers being left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. This is a good one to look at the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. You see the lateral wall of the left ventricle and the septum of the left ventricle. The inner atrial septum uh, is viewed, and if there was a PFO, this would be one of the views you could look at. The coronary sinus, when coronary sinus cannulation is occurring during heart surgery, this is a view that can be 
uh, change just a little bit to be able to see that coronary sinus. And the pulmonary veins come into the left atrium, and in this view you can see them. The next view is the mid-esophageal bicable view. And in this view you can see the superior vena cava to the right, the inferior vena cava to the left, and left atrium on top, and between the left atrium and the right atrium is the interatrial septum. That interatrial septum is where we would look for a patent foramen ovale. The mid-esophageal two-chamber two is shown on the bottom left. And in this view, you see only two chambers, the left atrium and the left ventricle. The anterior wall is to the right, and one of the uh, gaps in knowledge uh, about TEE and which walls we look at is that the inferior wall can be seen on the mid-esophageal two-chamber view. Then there's the mid-esophageal RV inflow-outflow view where you can see the aortic valve in all three cusps, the non-coronary cusp lying right against the interatrial septum, the right coronary cusp being the most anterior, and the left coronary cusp being the uh, one which the left main coronary artery comes off of. You also can see the tricuspid valve and the pulmonic valve, and it's called the RV inflow outflow because you can see blood coming into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve and out through the pulmonic valve. This is a view we often use when having difficulty placing a pulmonary artery catheter because we can see the catheter come right down through the tricuspid valve and guide it out the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery. Doppler and ultrasound. We use Doppler during TEE for many of our measurements. We uh, know that Doppler is sound waves of a known frequency that strike a moving target, which is red blood cells, and those uh, sound waves are reflected, and it changes the frequency of the reflection proportional to the velocity of the target, those red blood cells. Now, the Doppler has to be parallel with the flow of those red blood cells, because if the Doppler is actually perpendicular to flow, it measures zero velocity, because the cells are not moving towards the probe or away from the probe. And a correlate of this would be if a, a policeman was using a Doppler to measure your velocity of uh, your speed of your car as you're driving, they have to aim towards you or you going away from them, not you going past them. Because if you went straight past them and they hit the side of your car with the Doppler, it would bounce back with no change in frequency and it would measure zero velocity. Frequency is 1 over the time between the successive peaks or troughs of a wave. And the real important thing about frequency is that we use low frequencies to penetrate far into a tissue. One way to remember that is when you're hearing music in a distance, what do you hear? You usually hear the bass and the drums, the low frequency and not the high frequency. The high frequency is better to resolve small things uh, anatomically, so better resolution. So low frequency goes farther in, deeper penetration. We usually use very high frequency in echocardiography, 2 to 10 megahertz, which is 2 to 10 million cycles per second. There is continuous wave and pulse wave Doppler. Continuous wave is shown on the bottom right. First, it is a way to send sound waves continuously uh, uh, towards the uh, target and is receiving continuously and it's a good one to get a accurate measurement of high velocity of flow but it doesn't tell you where it's coming from. Um, while pulse wave Doppler has good range resolution meaning I can say I want it to pick up a specific area of blood flow and, and it sends the signal, hits that area, comes back so it is a good range resolution. I know where it comes from, but you can't measure high velocities with pulse wave Doppler. Let's go on to some physiologic topics now. Coronary blood flow. Most coronary blood flow to the left ventricle occurs during diastole. In the graphic on the far right, you can see first of all the aortic pressure, like our A-line trace, which goes up during systole, then the dichrotic notch, which is the start of diastole, then diastolic runoff. If you look at the left coronary artery in blue, you can see that during systole, there isn't a whole lot of blood flow going down the left coronary artery. The pressure is high, and the left ventricular muscle squeezes those epicardial to endocardial blood vessels, and there's very little blood flow that goes through them. But during diastole, when the left ventricle is relaxed, 
you can see that the left coronary artery gets a lot of blood flow. Now if you look at the green, which is the right coronary artery, you can see that during systole there is blood flow as well as during diastole. The coronary perfusion pressure by definition is equal to the diastolic blood pressure minus the pressure inside the heart during diastole. So the driving force for blood to go epicardially to endocardially. So we optimize coronary perfusion by keeping the diastolic blood pressure up and lowering the pressure inside the heart. One way to lower the pressure inside the heart is nitroglycerin. It decreases preload. The heart doesn't have as high of end diastolic volume. Therefore, the pressure goes down inside the heart. That's one of the major mechanisms of nitroglycerin's anti-ischemic effect, along with its uh, dilation of epicardial coronary blood vessels. We also want to slow the heart rate beta blockers being a way to do that because the more time we provide in diastole, the more time for blood to go down that left coronary artery to the left uh, heart muscle. There was a gap in knowledge in 2009 that said an increase in mean arterial pressure that was unaccompanied by an increase in diastolic arterial pressure will increase right ventricular free wall perfusion more than left ventricular perfusion. Now if you could do that, that would mean that uh, the increase in MAP was totally a rise in systolic blood pressure and not an increase in diastolic blood pressure. Well, you know that blood flow through the right coronary artery occurs during systole and diastole. So if systolic blood pressure goes up, you're going to help the right coronary and the perfusion of that right uh, ventricular free wall more than you would the left ventricle, which gets blood flow during diastole. Myocardial supply and demand, next physiology keyword, Things that change demand, heart rate. If heart rate goes up, you need more oxygen. If wall tension is uh, uh, higher, you need more oxygen. If it's more contractile, the left ventricle, you need more oxygen. Supply, we said that coronary perfusion pressure, by definition, diastolic blood pressure minus the pressure inside the heart during diastole, LVEDP. We want to keep that up. So the diastolic blood pressure up and the LVEDP down to maximally perfuse the myocardium. The heart rate's slow because the slower the heart rate, the more time is spent in diastole when blood flow is actually going to the left ventricle and keeping the pressure inside the heart low. Subendocardium, the inside part of the heart, is the most at risk for ischemia. It's farthest from the epicardial blood vessels, coronary blood vessels, and it's exposed to those high pressures inside the left ventricle. So the, the subendocardium, of all areas of the heart is the most at risk for myocardial ischemia. The graphic at the right is meant to demonstrate things that increase myocardial oxygen supply like tachycardia and a very full heart and a very contractile heart and hypertension while things that decrease myocardial oxygen and supply would be reduced coronary blood flow, fast heart rate with not much time in diastole, um, a very big heart again with high diastolic volume, LVEDV. If there's vasoconstriction of the corners or even a thrombosis in the corners. And then decreasing the hemoglobin would decrease the content. Uh, and if the oxygen saturation being delivered to the corner arteries was low, that would decrease overall myocardial oxygen supply. But you likely realize that the way that the myocardium gets its oxygen from what is supplied to it, it takes everything off the uh, hemoglobin molecule basically that it can and oxygen comes back in the coronary sinus very desaturated. So you have to increase flow rather than extracting more from what is supplied to it in the myocardial oxygenization system. Cardiac cycle and EKG. This is mainly to demonstrate diastole, but let's go through this. Systole is from the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Diastole is from the end of the T wave to the beginning of the next QRS complex. The first heart sound is closure of the tricuspid and mitral valve. The second heart sound is closure of the aortic and pulmonary valve. If you look at the blue trace up at the top, the light blue, you can see that there is closure of the tricuspid and mitral valve in the heart after the electrocardiographic uh, evidence of its stimulation, the QRS complex occurs, there's isovolumetric contraction. The pressure uh, 
builds up in that left ventricle until it's high enough to open the aortic valve and then ejection occurs. Ejection occurs and then the pressure starts to drop off and we get a dichrotic notch at the beginning of diastole. That's when there is closing of the aortic valve. And then there's diastolic runoff of blood flow. So let's look at the stages of diastole now. Diastole starts at the end of the T wave and at the dichrotic notch with closure of the aortic valve. And there is initially isovolumetric relaxation. The heart starts to relax without any change in volume. It relaxes until the pressure drops inside the left ventricle below the atrial pressure and the uh, mitral valve opens and there is initially a rapid inflow of blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle. When the pressure is equalized between the left atrium and the left ventricle, there's a short period of time called diastasis during diastole uh, where the pressures are equal and there's little flow. And then assuming that there is a P wave present and you're in sinus rhythm, there's an atrial kick or atrial systole that occurs that normally tops up our left ventricle about 25% or so of volume. In an elderly patient, a very thick left ventricle, long-standing hypertension, aortic stenosis, those are examples where the atrial kick may make a large component of topping up that left ventricle. And if you lose that atrial kick, severe hypotension can ensue. So the four stages of diastole are isovolumetric relaxation, opening of the mitral valve with rapid inflow, equalization of pressures with diastasis, then the atrial kick. If we put a Doppler as shown in the top right graphic in parallel, remember that Doppler has to be aligned parallel, not perpendicular if we're going to get a good Doppler signal, to the flow through the mitral valve during diastole. When the mitral valve is open, you get a pattern called an E and an A wave. The E wave is an example of the passive inflow or rapid inflow of blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Between the E and the A wave is diastasis when the pressure is equalized and then the A wave itself occurs in association with the P wave on the electrocardiogram which is the atrial uh, contraction. So diastasis, the four stages. Pressures versus volumes and their curves. Up at the top we're going to show left ventricular volume and left ventricular pressure. Pressure is shown in red. Let's look at that first. During systole there is from point 1 to point 2 isovolumetric contraction of the left ventricle until the pressure builds up and the aortic valve can open at point 2. That's during systole. Systole continues and blood is ejected. Uh, just before it's ejected, that's the end uh, at the mitral valve closing time, that is. That's the end diastolic volume. When it's full, before it starts to eject, during ejection, you're obviously losing some volume. So at the bottom, it's showing that volume decreasing in the left ventricle. And then at point three, the aortic valve closes. That's the beginning of diastole. Um, at this point, you have end systolic volume. And the difference between end diastolic volume when it's full and end systolic volume when it's uh, contracted and emptied is stroke volume. The pressure inside the left ventricle drops isovolumetric relaxation until the pressure inside is less than the left atrium, the mitral valve opens, and filling starts to occur again. So that's a pattern that goes on over and over in our hearts. At the bottom is shown left ventricular pressure on the y-axis versus left ventricular volume. And this is the classic pressure volume curve, and we're going to go through that now. At A represents the filling that is occurring across the mitral valve after the mitral valve opens at number four. Mitral valve opens, filling of the left ventricle occurs uh, from end systolic volume all the way up to end diastolic volume. So it was initially empty, now it's filling along point A along this curve, and then the mitral valve closes at one. That is end diastolic volume, if you trace it down to the x-axis, and that point is also end diastolic pressure if you trace that over to the y-axis. That end diastolic pressure of the left ventricle should be less than 18. We say that greater than 18 is very high. Then isovolumetric contraction occurs until the pressure in the left ventricle exceeds the aortic valve 
uh, opening pressure, and the aortic valve opens. Ejection occurs at C, and then the pressure drops, and the aortic valve closes. That's the beginning of diastole, and we have isovolumetric relaxation occurring until left atrial and left ventricle pressures um, equalize, and then <clears throat> at the point that the left ventricle pressure is less than left atrium, blood flow again starts to fill in that left ventricle. So we have this continuous filling and ejection going on, but several points that I want to point out is that the width of this, which is a representation of end systolic volume minus end diastolic volume, is stroke volume. So the width of this curve, if you look at that and it's wide, you say that's a pretty good stroke volume. If it's narrow, you say that's a pretty bad stroke volume. And where end diastolic volume is and end diastolic pressure at the bottom right. Those are the major points to take home from this graphic. The next physiologic keyword is cardiac pacemaker versus myocardial cells. The SA node and the AV node uh, are the pacemaker cells of our heart, usually the SA node taking over and controlling things. If it fails, the AV node takes over, and if that fails, um, Purkinje fibers, bundles of Hiss, and even the muscle of the heart can take over as a pacemaker. But there's differences in ionic movement in the sinoatrial node pacemaker cell versus the contractile myocardial cells. And if you look at the top right, you can see that when the sinoatrial node pacemaker fires, it spreads across the atria towards the AV node. And the AV node, uh, once it crosses that, it goes into the left ventricle. And its conduction occurs, there's a propagation of these action potentials through gap junctions. This is not classic neuromuscular junctions, in fact, this is one of the reasons why if you give rocuronium to a patient, yes, their striated skeletal muscle stops moving, but their heart doesn't stop moving. Um, now, if you look at the sinoatrial node and the contractile myocardium patterns, you can see that the sinoatrial node depolarizes and then rapidly repolarizes, as opposed to the contractile myocardium that depolarizes and stays depolarized for an extended period of time. This makes sense because you don't want the muscle to just contract and then immediately relax. The muscle needs to stay contracted for a period of time so that ejection can occur. So looking at the sinoatrial node first, you can see that in green represents the sodium coming in, and then depolarization, calcium coming in, blue, and then repolarization, potassium going out, and then sodium in green again uh, coming in as pacemaker action potential is occurring. If you think about this nodal tissue and the calcium it's a fact, you can then understand a little bit why, for example, diltiazem slows AV conduction, a calcium channel blocker, reducing that calcium influx and blocking conduction through it. Contractile muscle, you can see that in green, depolarization is the sodium coming in. But why does it stay depolarized or positive? Because calcium comes inside the cell that's a positively charged, keeps it positively charged inside, keeps that muscle contracting until potassium goes out uh, and repolarizes the uh, muscle. And everything starts over again. So there's differences between the pacemaker and the myocardial cells of ion flow. Cardiac innervation, a little bit easier to understand. It is innervated by the vagus nerve, which comes uh, from the brainstem, and the sympathetics, which we think of coming from the thoracic cord. Usually T1 through T4, we think of as the cardioaccelerator fibers. The vagus nerve releases acetylcholine, and it innervates the SA and the AV node mainly, resulting in reduced heart rate, or chronotropy, reduced dromotropy, or conduction through the AV node, slows it, and some effect on inotropy, but not a lot. The sympathetics release norepinephrine. T1 through T4 fibers come to the heart, SA and AV node, as well as the muscle of the heart, shown in yellow in the graphic on the far right. And when they release norepinephrine, there is an increased chronotropy, or heart rate, increased dromotropy, or conduction through the AV node, and increased inotropy via the beta-1 receptor effect on the cardiac muscle. Here's a question for you. Which one of the following medication-related effects is appropriately matched in a patient who has had a recent heart transplant? Would they get bradycardic with ephedrine? No. 
they have beta receptors on the heart, and they will speed up their heart rate to beta agonists. Phenylephrine and hypotension, no, phenylephrine is alpha agonist. Uh, effect majorly on the vascular smooth muscle. Milrinone and hypertension, no, milrinone causes both increased inotropy through phosphodiesterase inhibition and vasodilation. Will it cause esmolol? And uh, if you give esmolol, that is, will it cause bradycardia? And the answer is yes. There's beta receptors on the heart of a person who's had a heart transplant. So let's look at the denervated heart physiology next. Picture on the right is meant to demonstrate all the different anastomoses, SVC, IVC, aorta, and uh, pulmonary artery that are required when you transplant a heart. When you take out the uh, person's heart to put in the new one, the vagus nerve and the sympathetic innervations of that heart are lost. But the beta receptors that are on the muscle are present and they actually upregulate. They say, my sympathetic nerves aren't here, releasing norepinephrine, what's going on? And they start upregulating the number of beta receptors on the muscle. So they're going to respond to circulating catecholamines whether you give them exogenously or they're coming from your adrenal endogenously. If a patient with a heart transplant becomes hypotensive, reach for epinephrine early. It will, the heart will respond to the beta agonist effects of the epinephrine. It will not respond if they're bradycardic to atropine because there's no vagus nerve. And if you give neostigmine as part of reversal of neuromuscular blockade, you're not going to get bradycardia from that neostigmine. But you would still combine your neostigmine with an anticholinergic like glycoparlate because Neostigmine would raise acetylcholine levels at muscarinic receptors, and you'd still get the bronchoconstriction, salivation, etc. So that denervated heart has lost afferent uh, input, and so angina, you don't get it. Uh, if you stand up rapidly or change uh, body posture rapidly, you don't get those rapid reflexive changes in heart rate, like Valsalva, carotid sinus body position changes, and heart rate variability decreases, actually. There's an increase in resting heart rate that characteristically occurs. It's like taking the break off these patients when you cut the vagus, and their heart rate often is in that 90 to 110 range. And their heart rate is going to go up slower than yours would if they exert themselves because they are responding to circulating catecholamines rather than direct innervation from the sympathetic nerves. Cardiac reflexes, carotid sinus reflex, the baroreceptor reflex. The carotid sinus is present and is shown graphically on the far right at the bifurcation of the internal and external carotid. It is innervated by the ninth cranial nerve. And there are stretch receptors present in that carotid sinus that respond when the blood pressure goes up, for example, stretches the fibers in that carotid sinus, and via cranial nerve, send a signal to the brainstem, which then returns to the heart with signals to say, the blood pressure's up, let's slow the heart rate down. So an increased blood pressure results in a decreased heart rate. That's the barrel reflex. Um, and that plays a very important role during acute blood loss and shock. We want our heart rate to go up, go up when our blood pressure decreases, but this reflex arc actually loses its capacity at a blood pressure less than 50 millimeters of mercury or so. So if you're severely hypotensive, you may not get that tachycardia uh, that should occur reflexively. And that reflex is also impaired by our volatile anesthetics, propofol, and as mentioned, severe hypotension. During carotid endarterectomy, as they are messing around and pressing on the carotid sinus, you can see then how a signal could go from the ninth cranial nerve to the brainstem back to the heart via the vagus and slow the heart rate. So pressing on the carotid sinus can cause bradycardia and simply injecting local anesthetic lidocaine and filtrating it around the carotid sinus can block the nerves and then they can merrily go along and press on that carotid sinus without you having to deal with bradycardia. The chemoreceptor reflex is the next physiologic reflex to be discussed. The chemoreceptor cells are present in the carotid bodies and also in the aortic body, but the carotid bodies are right there also at that bifurcation between the external and internal carotid as shown in the graphic on the far right. The carotid body itself responds to mainly we think of P little AO2. So this is not 
This is not SpO2. This is not content. This is P little a O2, or tension of oxygen. A decrease in partial pressure of oxygen, your body says, I'm not getting enough oxygen. I need to breathe more, and ventilation goes up. So that's the natural response to hypoxia, those little carotid body senses it, and we hyperventilate in response. When the PO2 is very low, less than 50 millimeters of mercury, or conditions of acidosis, which potentiates it, impulses through the cranial nerve, 9, and 10 to the medulla, stimulates the respiratory centers of our medulla, increasing our ventilatory drive. What happens with bilateral carotid endarterectomy? What are some of the risks? Well, you've denervated both the carotid body, which normally responds to pilaleo 2 and you've denervated the carotid sinus, which responds to stretch. So the carotid body first, if you've denervated that, you lose the normal ventilatory response, which is hyperventilation, when hypoxia occurs, when there's a low PaO2. You can imagine if you had a COPD patient who has a baseline elevation in CO2, who's retaining CO2 and becomes less CO2 uh, sensitive over time, that if now they became not responsive to low oxygen also, they would have not much driving their uh, ventilatory system. There's also, when you denervate the carotid body, exquisite opioid sensitivity. And potential serious respiratory depression can occur when you administer opioids to these patients. The carotid sinus, which responds to stretch, ninth cranial nerve to the brainstem, tenth back to the heart, when there's hypertension to slow the heart rate, there's a loss of normal arterial pressure, responses to acute uh, uh, blood pressure uh, changes. So the denervated carotid sinus not going to respond to blood pressure like it did before. And after bilateral carotid endarterectomy, you can also have damage to nerves that are in the same area, like the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which could, if bilaterally injured, result in the vocal cords being together and actually obstructing the airway. Superior laryngeal nerve, which doesn't end up with airway obstruction, but can end up with vocal cord issues and a very whispery, uh, thready voice. Hypoglossal nerve injury would be the tongue. And as mentioned, the bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve is the real worry. But mainly when we think of bilateral carotid endarterectomy, think of denervation of the carotid body in the PaO2 response, which should be hyperventilation to hypoxia, which is blunted, and the denervated carotid sinus, which should be bradycardia in response to hypertension, which is also damaged. Next cardiac reflexes are Bainbridge and Bezold Riche reflex. The Bainbridge reflex, most important one first, that's the atrial reflex that says, when the atrium is stretched and very full, I need to make it smaller so the atria kicks in and says, I gotta get faster so I can be more empty. So in the graphic on the top right, if you infuse fluids intravenously and increase the right atrial pressure, the atrial receptors are stimulated and the heart rate increases. Stretch receptors are present in the atrium and it's a way to adjust the heart rate in response to blood volume. Now, a clinical correlate of this is spinal anesthesia in a young patient and cardiac arrest. And think about this for a moment. If you put in a spinal anesthetic and cause a sympathectomy with venodilation and, veno, and vasodilation, the venodilation reduces preload. The atrium is not stretched. It gets very small. And if it gets small, bradycardia and even asystole has occurred. And this is one of the purported mechanisms of cardiac arrest after spinal anesthesia in a healthy person. The bezold jerice reflex is basically a reflex where if you have irritation of the left ventricle from like ischemia, the heart rate slows down and it also becomes hypotensive. And it's this chemoreceptors and mechanical re mechanical receptors in the left ventricle that sense this noxious ventricular stimuli like myocardial ischemia can occur after revascularization and the problem is, is that uh, patients can become very bradycardic and hypotensive. But one of the things that we think about is maybe it has a coronary artery uh, protective reflex in that if the heart rate slows, the coronary arteries get more blood flow. And if the coronary arteries vasodilate, they get more blood flow. So basal jerice reflex, but Bainbridge is the one that we want to focus mostly on where the atrium stretching and filling increases the heart rate.
Question for you. Valsalva maneuver is performed during echocardiographic determination of possible patent foramen ovale. Which of the following hemodynamic effects is most likely to occur immediately following release of Valsalva? So if the patient was awake, you'd have them bear down and raise their intrathoracic pressure. If they're asleep, you would close your APL valve on your circuit and raise the intrathoracic pressure, hold the bag in inflation, and then release it. What happens? During release, cardiac output doesn't decrease. Um, what actually happens is during release, the right atrial pressure increases, and we're going to look, that, look at that pictorially in the next slide. PFO diagnosis. We do a Valsalva with a bubble study in patients that we think might have a PFO. Someone with a transient ischemic attacks and who's having paradoxical embolization to their head across the PFO from the right side. Uh, someone who's got a very low PaO2 in the ICU who you think might have a right to left shunt and it's not responding the PaO2 to increases in FiO2 which you know is by definition usually a shunt. What we do is take this patient and if they are intubated we cause a increase in intrathoracic pressure. We give a breath and hold it. Hold it, hold it. As we're holding it, the intrathoracic pressure rises and venous return to the right side of the heart goes down. So the right-sided pressures go down. But then as we release the valsalva, release the breath, we inject agitated saline bubbles through a peripheral IV. And as you release the valsalva, the intrathoracic pressure drops suddenly and blood rushes into the right atrium, raises the right atrial pressure. And for an instant, the right atrial pressure actually exceeds the left atrial pressure. And those little bubbles that come in through at the bottom here, you can see them coming in on uh, number two in the bubble study. The bubbles come in, and if the right atrial pressure exceeds left atrial pressure, and there is a PFO, the little bubbles sneak across to the left side. So that is a way to uh, perform a diagnostic maneuver to look for a PFO is to use the Valsalva. So the Valsalva maneuver is another one of our cardiac reflexes where if you have a forced expiration against a closed glottis in a wake patient, raising the intrathoracic pressure, it decreases venous return to the right side of the heart, blood pressure decreases, and if you Valsalva uh, and it causes that decrease in blood pressure, your baroreceptors up in the carotid sense the drop in blood pressure and your heart rate goes up. Okay. So Valsalva reduces venous return, blood pressure drops, cardiac output drops, and your carotid senses that and says, I better increase my heart rate. But when the glottis suddenly opens and venous return increases because intrathoracic pressure is dropped, suddenly blood rushes into the right side, and that's when you'd see that right to left shunt if you had bubbles injected across a PFO. And cardiac output goes up, blood pressure goes up, and as your blood pressure goes up, you get a reflex decrease in heart rate. So the pictorial on the right is showing a Valsalva maneuver uh, and blood pressure at the top, heart rate in the middle, beats per minute, and at the bottom, mouth pressure. And as you can see, when mouth pressure goes up and you hold it for this 10 seconds here, venous return goes down and uh, uh, the left ventricular cavity size goes down. And then when you have a sudden release of the Valsalva, there's a rush of blood to the right side, fills that, and then to the left side, and blood pressure goes up and cardiac output goes up. That's the Valsalva maneuver. The Cushing's reflex we normally think of during uh, neurosurgical procedures and in the neurosurgical ICU where someone who has a high intracranial pressure, the brain says, I want to live, I need to perfuse the head, so I need to raise the systemic blood pressure. And with a person with a high intracranial pressure, their blood pressure now might go up to 220, let's say over 120. But their carotid sinus is still enervated. So it says, I'm stretched, blood pressure's up, I better slow the heart rate. So with hypertension occurs bradycardia. And because the brain stem is starting to herniate, you can have respiratory pattern changes. And those are the three components of the Cushing's reflex. Increased blood pressure, bradycardia, and changes in ventilatory pattern. Oculocardiac reflex is the next one. If you tug on the eyeball, for example, during eye surgery, we can see bradycardia. The fifth cranial nerve is involved here.
And in the graphic on the right, you can see the superior ciliary nerve going to the, uh, to the uh, ciliary ganglion, which is represented by CG, to the Gasserian ganglion, and all this is through cranial nerve number five to the brainstem, which then connects up with the vagus nerve and sends it back to the heart and slows the heart rate. So stretch receptors are present in the extraocular muscles that when you stimulate them, either by tugging on those muscles or increasing the pressure of the globe, uh, which can be done by things like just pressing on the eyeball or even doing a retrobulbar block and injecting local anesthetic behind the eyeball, um, can result in bradycardia. Again, the afferents through the ciliary nerve to the ciliary ganglion, cranial nerve number five, efferents via uh, the vagus nerve to the heart causing bradycardia. So it's a 5-10 reflex as opposed to a 9-10 reflex that we talked about during the carotid sinus. Last couple slides in part one are related to preoperative topics. Beta blockers in the perioperative period what do we do about giving beta blockers to patients with heart disease who are beta blocker naive? Should we give them to them? And the POISE trial would suggest that if we give uh, extended release metoprolol uh, to beta blocker naive, naive patients, patients that have not been on beta blockers before, we may be able to decrease the risk of non-fatal MI, but there's an increased risk of stroke and actual mortality. So in general, we tend not to introduce extended release metoprolol uh, to patients that are beta blocker naive in the preoperative period. The American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology's recommendations are don't withdraw beta blockers abruptly to patients who are coming to uh, surgery. Beta blockers should be continued in those who have been on beta blockers because they can reduce preoperative cardiac events um, now let's look at those ACC AH guidelines and specifically two things. One, what about a patient with a coronary stent? And two, risk stratification. On the far left is the graphic from the ACC AHA guidelines on coronary stents. And if someone has had a stent implantation in the last month, month and a half or so, and they need to come for surgery, and it's an elective surgery, it's better to delay that surgery until after, after an optimal period which bare metal stents, we say at least 30 days, and drug eluting stents, it's better if you can go a whole year uh, as they endothelialize and hopefully won't clot then in the perioperative period when there's high stress and activation of platelets. So we think of that one year as being optimal for drug eluting stents and 30 days at least for a bare metal stent. And cardiologists may make their determination of whether to put in a bare metal stent or a drug looting stent based upon if a patient's going to need a surgery in a short period of time thereafter. Now, if you have a drug eluting stent and the risk of surgical delay is greater than the risk of uh, thrombosing that DES, um, you can proceed to surgery after uh, 180 days. And so this newer recommendation that elective non-cardiac surgery after a drug eluting stent may be considered after six months is in place, and it's a 2B type recommendation. Again, remembering that if you can wait for that full year, probably better, but if you need to undergo elective non-cardiac surgery uh, after a drug eluting stent, six months, you should at least try to wait that long. And then start up your aspirins and uh, your other antiplatelet agents. Um, in the postoperative period. The graphic on the far right is meant to demonstrate the well-known ACC AHA guidelines for determining further testing or no further testing in patients who are coming for surgery. If it's an emergent surgery, you just risk stratify them and go to surgery. You have to do it. But if you have time uh, to work a patient up, you can estimate the perioperative risk of uh, cardiac complications after surgery using some of the criteria from the ACC AHA guidelines. And if they are a low risk, um, you can say no, no further testing and go to surgery. If they're elevated risk and they can do more than four METs, that is climb more than two flights of stairs, uh, you say, hmm, maybe no, no further testing. In fact, if they can do more than 10 METs, you say that's a class 2A recommendation for no further testing. And if they can do uh, four to 10 METs or so, that we say no further testing, a 2B. The recommendation. So it's stronger if they can do more exercise without problems. But if you don't 
know how many Mets they can do. They're in a wheelchair, for example. Um, and you think it's less than four, um, or it is less than four, and further testing can impact your decision making or perioperative care, then pharmacologic stress testing is indicated. And if abnormal, coronary revascularization, according to some of the criteria that have been previously established, could be accomplished. The last slide in this series is cardiac risk assessment and preoperative electrocardiogram. The revised cardiac risk index is what many cardiologists are using when they are looking at patients preoperatively in consultation. And it's a way to estimate the risk of cardiac complications after surgery. And it's based upon these uh, six things here. Is it a high risk surgery, intraperitoneal, intrathoracic, uh, vascular surgery, supraingonal vascular. Is there a history of ischemic heart disease like a previous MI or a positive exercise treadmill test or chest pain using nitrates? Um, or is there a history of congestive heart failure, history of uh, previous TIA or stroke, uh, diabetes with insulin treatment being used preoperatively? then kidneys that aren't working so well when there's a preoperative creatinine greater than two. Those are the criteria in the revised cardiac index where points are added up and risk is assessed. Now, when do you get an electrocardiogram, one of the key words that's been uh, from the American Board of Anesthesia? And here's the guidelines for that. The red arrow is to show when you get an EKG, and that is if someone has signs or symptoms of cardiovascular disease preoperatively, get an electrocardiogram. If they have no signs or symptoms of cardiovascular disease, but they're undergoing high-risk surgery, get an electrocardiogram. If they have no signs or symptoms of cardiovascular disease and they're undergoing a, an intermediate-risk surgery, and they have at least one uh, revised cardiac risk index, clinical risk factor, as talked about just previously, then get an electrocardiogram. But if they're undergoing low-risk surgery and have no signs or symptoms of cardiovascular disease, or even intermediate risk surgery without any of the RCRI, revised cardiac risk index, clinical risk factors, then don't get an electrocardiogram. This ends part one of a three-part series of cardiac keyword review. Um, I love quotes. This is from Martin Luther King. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. I hope you have a wonderful day.